Okay, so uh, in today's lecture, we're going to be looking at uh, double bonds. Carbon-carbon uh, double bonds are incredibly important uh, in uh, organic synthesis, and being able to control their geometry is, is, in, uh, is something we're going to have to learn about. Um, the double bonds is found in Chapter 27 of the Clayton textbook that we're working through. Uh, but it's, uh, for historic reasons, um, this has actually ended up from uh, uh, the original chapter has been combined into another chapter. So we're going to be starting around page 677. Um, so it's about halfway through this uh, chapter. The chapter itself, chapter 27, is about uh, the chemistry of uh, sulfur, silicon, and, and, and phosphorus. Uh, and it's within that context that there's some double bond chemistry, and that's what we want to, to focus on. So I just remind you about this. Uh, you know, with, with double bonds, what we're talking about, one of the most important things is, of course, the fact that a double bond, a carbon-carbon double bond, can either be trans or, or cis. And the, we need to figure out and know the chemistry of how to be able to do those, uh, those types of, be able to synthesize either a trans or a cis carbon-carbon double bond. So just a, as a way of reminding you some of the chemistry you actually already know, um, the, the one way we can do this is through uh, reduction. So if we reduce a triple bond, all right, an alkyne, so for instance, a triple bond that maybe looks like this, just a very simple um, pentyne. Uh, if we take that uh, pentyne and we reduce it, but we reduce it selectively using Lindless catalyst, and of course the reducing agent is H. Uh, to hydrogen. If we would do that reduction, we get uh, preferentially the cis alkene being formed. All right, so it will look like that. We know that chemistry. Uh, alternatively, we could also reduce the alkyne with uh, under sort of birch conditions. This is using sodium and liquid ammonia, so it's very cold conditions. Get uh, that. We do a single electron reduction, and then what happens is we end up forming the. Uh, uh, trans um, alkene product. So that's one way, taking a triple bond and reducing it. Another way which we should already know, and we just got to remind ourselves about this, is the elimination uh, reaction. So we can get a leaving group two to go, like bromine, and we can do the elimination, and we can get a, a double bond. Uh, if we do E1 elimination reactions, these ones tend to go to trans double bonds because these are more stable. Um, but E2 eliminations are stereospecific. And because of that, because of the fact that they're stereospecific, it means that the, the chirality of the starting material is actually important. So if I use this very simple example over here, this is nothing um, terribly uh, challenging. Uh, we just use this compound here, and I want to do an elimination reaction, this is CH3. Um, we need to use a strong base, like potassium tertiary butoxide. Uh, and what happens in an E2 elimination is the base picks up, we should remember this, the base is going to pick up the proton and we get a pi nu pi bond being formed and the bromine leaving. The most important thing with this reaction though was that the reaction is in a one-step process and the proton and the bromine have to be antiperiplanar to each other. And that controls the stereochemistry of the product, the geometry of the double bond. We can work this out using Newman projections, which is something that you should be able to do because we will use this later on in the course. So what we do here is we can look down this bond over there. Uh, so we stick our eye, right, and we look down this bond. We can down this bond and what do we see? Well, we draw out the Newman projection. It's going to look like this. All right, that's our basic uh, framework for the Newman projection. And here we see the phenyl group is, as, as we're looking with our eye, the phenyl is pointing straight down, which is over there. On the other side, the ethyl group is facing directly up. All right, this is the plane of our paper. So everything on the right-hand side is facing up. So when we look at this, the bromine is up, so it's over here. On this carbon over here, which is at the back, the CH3 is up, it's over there. And we can do the uh, other ones uh, as well, All right? We've got the ethyl, um, sorry, the H uh, over there. All right. So when we drawn out our Newman projection, this proton, this halogen are the ones that are leaving. 
in its current conformation that we've drawn out over here, which happens the way I drew it out in the beginning, just so happened that way, they are anti-periplanar to each other, so the base can come pick up that proton. This one goes in, it's difficult to draw it now because it's coming out towards us, forms the double bond between the carbon in the front and the carbon at the back, and this leaves over there. All right, so that means that the phenyl and the CH3 are on the same side and the proton and the ethyl group are on the same side. So when we draw out our product, uh, it just so happens to work out that it looks uh, like pretty much like the starting material that we did. Some new chemistry though that I want to uh, um, speak to you about is another kind of elimination reaction that can occur to form double bonds. And this is the elimination of uh, sulfur containing compounds. In this case we're going to be doing uh, sulfoxides. So let's just explain this. If we take a compound that looks like this, this is sulfide as a functional group. It's got two R groups on the sulfur carbon groups. It's, a, it's known as a sulfide. And if we oxidize it just once, all right, just adding one oxygen atom to it, we can use either MCPBA uh, or we could use uh, sodium peridate. This is another good uh, uh, oxidant. Uh, even uh, H2O2, hydrogen peroxide and acetic acid works as well. But we need to control the amount of oxygen we add. We just want to add it once and we'll, what happens is we oxidize that sulfur and we get a sulfoxide. I've drawn it out this way, if, as you'll see now just why I've drawn it this way, but um, essentially I've uh, we can draw sulfoxides with a double bond to oxygen and sulfur so then there's no charges or we can draw it like this. Both are completely acceptable um, but you're going to see now why drawing it this way is just going to help us do um, what we're going to do next. The thing is if you take a sulfoxide and uh, that's on a, uh, an alkane, if you take this it is possible when you heat up this reaction, um, just warm it gently, you're going to get an elimination reaction. This oxygen is going to pick up the proton that's going to kick in over there and this bond is going to kick onto the sulfur and so the product of that is the alkene in this case because of our starting material it's the cyclohexenone the conjugated unsaturated uh, system and then we also get the phenyl sulfenic acid uh, byproduct uh, but this is very unstable and so it actually just breaks down into volatile compounds and uh, uh, disappears. So this is a, a good way of introducing double bonds. Um, the only thing that's important is, well, you know this chemistry, but the question would be, well, how do we get this there in the first place? Well, that's actually a lot easier than you might think, and that's just because um, all we need is to start off with like the ketone, like the cyclohexanone, um, and through enolate chemistry we can add an electrophilic source of the sulfur. So enolate chemistry, good way of generating the enolate there, is with uh, LDA, obviously minus 78 degrees Celsius is a good start, and then we add the electrophilic form of the, uh, the uh, phenyl sulfide, and so we need a leaving group on here. The easiest is actually just to have another um, phenyl sulfide there. So this is uh, diphenyl disulfide and this is a good electrophile. Obviously one part of this gets wasted in the in the reaction, becomes an S minus, but it's a good way of introducing sulfides and therefore being able to make a double bond in this way.